Welcome to Things That Go Perump in the Night. I'm your host, Tim Doyle, lead investigator of UFO Seekers, UFO and Alien Investigators, located in Perump, Nevada. And this show broadcasts from Perump, Nevada, the hometown of the late and great Art Bell. Famous host of Coast to Coast AM, of course, we love the classy George Norrie, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. But Tracy and I have this soft spot for Mr. Bell, which is kind of one of the reasons we moved to Perum. And we love our new hometown. But tonight, we're talking UFOs. If you call them that, I call it UFO sightings. But we're talking about the Travis Walton incident. And we're going to cover it maybe more in depth than you ever have before. And you're going to find out there's things that are believable about it. There are things that fell through about it. So for believer or for skeptic, it is literally the ultimate. It's the greatest alien abduction event documented in American history. And I found the greatest historical description from the time. So this isn't uh, been manip manipulated or rewritten. This is from 1977, so it's about a year and a half, maybe two after. It's about a year and a half after the incident. And it recounts everything, even down to Dr. Hynek and that he supported Travis Walton. Pretty crazy. What's really crazy is five of the six witnesses passed polygraphs. Travis didn't, but the witnesses did, which is kind of wicked. They were that good or it like seriously happened. But that's for the believer, right? So let's get down to business here. We're looking at the Tucson Citizen, July 23rd, 1977. We're reading from a hardcore journalist because journalism existed in ancient America. Ancient America is like 20 years ago. And this article is written by Paul Allen. Title of the article, Five Days Aboard a UFO, The Aftermath. And it goes like this. Travis Walton, say it again. No, it just isn't the Evil Knievel Joshua Heffitz type name that sticks in your mind. But Travis Walton, according to reports filed with the Navajo County Sheriff's Department, was transported aboard an unidentified flying object near Heber, Arizona, in November 1975 and spent five days as the guest prisoner of seven beings not of this world. Oh, that Travis Walton. It was shortly after 7.30 p.m. on November 5th when six loggers, described as extremely upset and one of them weeping, told Herber Base Deputy Chuck Ellison a story that sounded like a script from a Star Trek episode. They'd seen a flying saucer, they swore, and a beam of light from the craft had stunned their friend, knocked him to the ground, and the friend had disappeared. It was the sort of story that makes seasoned lawmen and cynical editors look at each other with knowing glances. The editors with a sense of humor printed accounts of the incident for what it was worth because people read these sorts of stories, whether or not they have any basis in fact. Those without a funny bone simply deposited the stories in the nearest trash can. Then five days later, when the victim of the saucer snatching reappeared with a story of awakening aboard a craft and un a craft with unearthly beings looking down on him, and of later finding himself lying on his abdomen on a road outside Heber, another flurry of stories and that nasty word hoax appeared. More knowing glances, but it was not the end of the workday for Walton a 22-year-old logger, and for six other members of the crew. After 6 p.m., they were 15 miles south of Heber in the Apache Sitgreaves National Forest on their way home. Walton and the rest of the crew, Michael Rogers, 28, Ken Peterson, 25, and John Goulet, 21, Alan Dallas, 21, Dwayne Smith, 19, and Steve Pierce, 17 were under contract to the U.S. Forest Service and had spent the day thinning trees with chainsaws. They were aboard a truck when Walton, in the right-hand seat in the cab, noticed a yellowish glow ahead and to the right of the truck. 
showing through a growth of pine trees. As they approached a clearing, the men were to tell investigators they were stunned to see a glowing object about 30 yards to their right, hovering 15 to 20 feet above a pile of slash or tree trimmings. The object was about 15 feet in diameter and about 8 feet high, they said. It glowed with a soft golden color, giving the appearance of hot metal, with the color broken by a series of darker dividers which had a dull silver appearance. Walton called to Rogers to stop the truck but jumped out before it stopped and began walking towards the object. Then three things happened, according to other crew members. A beeping noise came from the glowing object, followed by a noise similar to that made by a generator starting up, followed by a series of rumbling sounds. The object began to wobble on its axis, then and as Walton took a step to the left, a narrow ray of intense greenish-blue light came from the object and struck him. The light beam, which some of the witnesses said, made a zapping sound, lifted the logger about a foot off the ground. The other crew member said and surrounded his body with a glow. His head was knocked back and his arms and legs were flung outward. The other crewmen, terrified, sped from the scene in the truck. After retreating about a quarter mile, however, and out of the immediate area of the object, they stopped. Rogers said he then saw a light rise from the area they had just left and streak to the northeast. Gathering their courage, the crewmen drove back to the site. They found no sign of the object or their companion. Travis Walton had disappeared. Travis lived in Phoenix as a child. He moved with his family to the small town of Payson about nine years ago, then moved to another small town, Snowflake. His family was described as close and supportive, but not given to displaying emotions in public. Travis himself, somewhat thin, with reddish hair and blue-green eyes, had a few close friends. He liked to read. He wasn't especially interested in sports or other participation type events and was described as a quiet, private person. While in high school, he drifted in with a bad crowd, did some experimenting with drugs, got into a scrape with the law over some stolen and forged payroll checks, and dropped out of school. Realizing apparently that his life was heading in in a direction he didn't like, he stopped the drug experiments and re-entered high school. Experimentation and re-entered high school. After graduation, he enrolled at Northern Arizona University and completed a year there before returning to Snowflake. Once back, he worked at several jobs, most of them involving thinning trees in the forest with a chainsaw often working for Michael Rogers. Unable to find Travis, Rogers and the other crew members drove to Heber and notified Deputy Ellison shortly after 7.30 p.m. Ellison Sheriff Marlon Gillespie and another sheriff's official went with the three of the witnesses, went with three of the witnesses back to the scene, but stopped the search at about midnight after failing to find any trace of the object or of Walton. The following day, a search party of 40 to 50 persons, including U.S. Forest Service personnel, members of the Sheriff's Posse, friends and relatives of Walton and others, covered an area with a radius about 2.5 miles, Sheriff Gillespie said. The second search was called off that afternoon at the request of Mrs. Mary Kellett, Travis's mother, who said she was convinced her son had indeed been picked up by a UFO and that further search would be futile. Walton's brother Duane, who also took part in the search, decided to stay in the area, Gillespie said, believing the craft would return his brother to the same spot. And we'll read more when we come back from commercial break.
to have a regular life and just in a career. And I'd come home, be tired from work, and I'd turn on the television, and hey, there's a UFO, an alien show. And so I believed it all, you know, but then there came a day where my life changed, and then all of a sudden I was that person out there investigating this topic. Thousands of hours watching the sky, night vision, FLIR, optical video, photography. So I'm here to teach you and to help you become a real UFO investigator. I need you. UFO seekers need you. More importantly, the public needs you to help them stay safe and to bring them the truth about this topic of UFO and aliens. So if you want to learn more, visit our website at ufoseekers.com. Tim Doyle, lead investigator of UFO Seekers, UFO and Alien Investigators, located in Pahrump, Nevada, and I'm broadcasting from Pahrump, Nevada. We've been digging deep into the Travis Walton UFO incident, and right now we're reading in depth what happened in the Travis Walton incident front to back. And we're continuing on right where we left off before the break. When the second search failed to turn up any trace of Walton, law enforcement officers checked out another possibility that had occurred to them, that Walton might have met with foul play and that the UFO sighting was concocted to cover the crime. On November 10th, five days after Walton had disappeared and the day before he was to return, the six witnesses were asked to submit to a Department of Public Safety polygraph examination, a lie detector test. The six were asked the following questions. One, did you cause Travis Walton any serious physical injury last Wednesday afternoon? Two, do you know if Travis Walton was physically injured by some other member of your work crew last Wednesday? Three, do you know if Travis Walton's body is buried or hidden somewhere in the Turkey Springs area? 4. Did you tell the truth about actually seeing a UFO last Wednesday when Travis Walton disappeared? Each of the men answered no to questions 1, 2, and 3, and each answered yes to question 4. C. E. Gilson, the polygraph examiner, said in his subsequent report, based on the polygraph chart tracing, it is the opinion of this examiner that Goulet, Smith, Peterson, Rogers, and Pierce were being truthful when they answered these relevant questions. He later said Dallas's test results were inconclusive because he was uncooperative and belligerent and resented being questioned by law for enforcement officials. Gilson's report concluded these polygraph examinations prove that these five men did see some object that they believe to be a UFO. Some glances became less knowing. <clears throat> Shortly after midnight on November 11th, the telephone in the home of Mrs. Grant Neff, Walton's sister, rang in Taylor and Travis speaking in vague terms with a voice described as weak and confused said he was in a telephone booth at a Herber service station. Mrs. Neff's husband and Walton's brother Duane drove to Herber where they found Travis slumped in a telephone booth. At Walton's mother's home a confused Travis recounted bits and pieces of information he remembered from the five-day ordeal. After the light beam hit him, he said he was knocked unconscious. He awoke to find himself lying on a table, an apparatus of some sort resting on his lower chest. Standing over him were three hairless beings, all about five feet tall, with large eyes and small noses, mouths and ears. They were dressed in loose-fitting coveralls and an orange 
tan color and reminded Walton of human fetuses, he said. He had difficulty breathing and felt pain in his head and chest. Realizing his situation, he said he panicked and lurched upward, knocking the apparatus from his chest. He said he knocked one of the beings back with his arm and backed away from them to a shelf. He said he grabbed for one of several objects on the shelf, a transparent cylinder about two inches in diameter and approximately 18 inches long, and knocked it against the edge of the table, hoping to break the object and leave a sharp edge to defend himself. The object didn't break, however, and the beings advanced toward him, hands raised with palms toward him. Walton said he yelled at them and took a swing with the cylindrical object. The beings then apparently decided against further confrontation, turned, and left. Walton went through the door and turned left. The beings had turned right down a corridor. The size of the enclosure indicated he was inside something larger than the craft he first saw in the woods, he said. He said he entered a second room and discovered a chair with a lever built into the left arm and a series of push buttons and a screen on the right arm. He said he could see what appeared to be stars on a view screen and moving the lever on the chair arm seemed to make them move. Further experimenting, showed that pushing the buttons on the right arm made a series of segmented lines move on the small screen on the chair's arm. Fearing what might happen if he continued to manipulate the controls, Walton left them alone. Shortly after, a fourth being appeared, this one a human-appearing male dressed in blue clothing and transparent helmet entered the room and just gestured for Walton to follow him. Walton's questions were met with a smile, he said later, but the blue-clad being made no verbal response. Walton said he was let out the door through an airlock and down a ramp to a large enclosure that appeared to be a hangar. He said he looked back and saw he was exiting a disc-shaped craft similar to but larger than the craft he first saw. He said he could breathe normally in the larger area, which was more brightly lighted than the craft, and said he saw several disc-shaped objects sitting about the enclosure. The logger said he was guided into another room where he was met by three more human-appearing beings, one female and two males, dressed in light blue clothing but minus helmets. His guide continued to wear his helmet, Walton said, and walked on through the room and exited. An object resembling an oxygen mask was placed over his face, he said, and he lost consciousness. He awoke lying on his abdomen and looked up to see a disc-shaped object rising into the sky above him. The hard surface under him proved to be the road outside Heber. He made his way into town and telephoned his sister. Walton was back. Word spread quickly and the telephone rang constantly. Newspapers wanted stories, interviews, photos. Organizations interested in UFOs offered assistance. Law enforcement officials wanted an explanation. Dwayne Walton took charge. He told news media callers that his brother had been taken to a Tucson hospital. He hadn't. In an effort to still the jangling of the telephone, he spoke with Bill Spaulding, director of Phoenix-based Ground Saucer Watch, with whom he had been in contact after Travis's disappearance. On Spaulding's advice, he took Travis to Phoenix to consult with Lester Stewart, believing him to be a medical doctor. After learning that Stewart was a hypnotherapist rather than a medical doctor, the two returned to Snowflake. 
Coral Lorenzen of the Tucson-based Aerial Phenomena Research Organization, APRO, called to offer assistance and arrange for Walton to be examined by two doctors that afternoon. Walton, apparently, was unaffected physically by his experience other than some weight loss and a small puncture wound on his left, inside his left elbow, similar to the mark left by a blood test. Duane did not notify Sheriff Gillespie until the day after Walton had returned, but told him also that his brother was in a Tucson hospital. The National Enquirer, a tabloid newspaper with national leadership, sent a reporting team to Phoenix and arranged to have the Walton brothers housed in a hotel out of reach of other media representatives and a month later ran a story on Travis's experience. And we'll read more when we come back from this commercial break. TV, United States government says they found uh, alien spaceships making war with military, the American television. And they say too, it's uh, alien spaceships. Oh yes, I have heard this myself. But you know, I don't know what we are to believe. Have you heard conversations like this? For answers to difficult questions like these, turn to UFO Seekers at ufoseekers.com. Tim Doyle, lead investigator of UFO Seekers, UFO and Alien Investigators, located in Pahrump, Nevada. And I am broadcasting from Pahrump, Nevada. And we've been reading into the Travis Walton UFO incident in depth. And we are going to continue right where we left off before the break. The cry of hoax surfaced in newspapers when Spalding complained that the Waltons had refused to be interviewed by J. Allen Hynek, a Northwestern University astronomer who works with the Center for UFO Studies. Their refusal cast doubt on the whole scenario, Spalding implied. Stewart, the hypnotherapist, said in a newspaper interview that he considered the story a hoax and said Walton's appearance the morning of his return suggested he might have been under the influence of drugs. Four days after his return, Walton took a polygraph test paid for by the National Enquirer, which the examiner, John J. McCarthy, interpreted to show Walton was lying about the saucer incident. A PRO spokesman claimed Walton still was not emotionally prepared for such a test and said three psychiatrists who examined him on the same occasion said his emotional condition would render any test results meaningless. In February, Walton, Brother Duane, and his mother each underwent another series of polygraph tests and the examiner, George Pfeiffer, interpreted the results to show they were not attempting to to perpetrate a hoax. When the dust had settled, then the following opinions, among others, had emerged. James Lorenzen, director of APRO. I think that he is describing a real experience to the best visibility. I believe that what happened to him was physical, but that he has some impairment of memory. He can't recall all of it. I believe he was transported aboard some sort of craft. No one has come up with an alternative workable hypothesis. Philip J. Class, a senior editor with Aviation Week in Space Technology and author of UFOs Explained, in a copyrighted report. The alleged UFO abduction of Travis Walton is a hoax, and the claims of six other young woodcutters that they saw the alleged incident are not true. C. E. Gilson, Department of Public Safety, Polygraph Examiner. These polygraph examinations prove that these Five men, the witnesses, excluding Dallas, did see some object that they believed to be a UFO. If an actual UFO did not exist, 
and the UFO is a man-made hoax. Five of these men had no prior knowledge of a hoax. John J. McCarthy, Polygraph Examiner. When he, Travis, answered the questions, I got gross deception response readings on all questions. In my opinion, he and the others were perpetrating a hoax. He added, my conclusion was that he was lying. Sheriff Marlon Gillespie. I didn't put much stock in Walton's story at the time. He declines to say, however, whether or not he believes the incident occurred. The case is still open as far as we're concerned. J. Allen Hynek the astronomer who subsequently did interview Walton. Walton has been made the subject of a lot of unnecessary and unfounded accusations, he said, and he believes Walton is not hoaxing. Bill Spalding, aerospace engineer and director of Phoenix-based Ground Saucer Watch. After conducting a thorough investigation with Philip Class, I consider this to be, without a doubt, the biggest hoax ever perpetuated on the American people. He added, I have 500 pages of documentation to prove it. George J. Pfeiffer, Polygraph Examiner. It is the opinion of this examiner that Travis Walton answered the questions in a manner that he, himself, is firmly convinced to be truthful regarding the incident concerning 11-5-1975. Later, he added, I'm not saying he did. I'm not saying he didn't. He is convinced he did. He wasn't displaying any deception on the polygram, and he would be the one to know if a hoax existed. In the interim, too, followed the inevitable, inevitable spate of charges and counterclaims, including allegations that Class wants to disprove the Walton incident to support his book, UFOs Explained, that claims flying saucers do not exist, and because he has several $10,000 bets that no one can prove otherwise. Pfeiffer was relatively inexperienced at the time he performed the polygraph test of the Waltons and drew conclusions from the charts that weren't substantiated by the charts, and that he allowed the Waltons to dictate some of the questions used in the test. APRO supports Walton's claim based solely on the polygraph results and that APRO people are manipulating Walton for their own devices. Spalding was miffed because the Waltons chose to work closely with APRO and cried hoax in retaliation. Stewart, the hypnotherapist, was affronted because of the Waltons' rejection of his services after Travis's return. In retaliation, he implied Walton was under the influence of drugs. Walton's supporters discounted the McCarthy polygraph findings. Walton failed it, saying Walton was not emotionally ready to undergo testing because they were unhappy with the test results. McCarthy botched the test by phrasing questions in such a way that Walton could not possibly have passed the test, and that McCarthy had unnerved Walton by questioning him prior to the test about a previous brush with the law. Polygraph examiner Gilson erred in including the question about the existence of the flying saucer with three others that dealt with possible criminal activity involving the assault or slaying of Walton. Such mixed questions do not give valid test results, complainants insist. Gillespie, because his re-election as sheriff depended on public opinion, presented facts in such a way that they might be misinterpreted. Hynek, despite his prominence and his work on several major government astronomical and space-related projects, has tended to step beyond the bounds of a reasonable man in some of his pronouncements on the subject of UFOs. And so it goes. The consensus, then, is that there is no consensus. There are those who believe and those who do not believe, just as there were when the incident first came to light. Back in Snowflake, after the initial flurry of excitement had subsided, the town chose up sides, those who believed Travis Walton and those who didn't. People here are pretty well balanced, I guess, Walton said. It's about half and half those who are skeptical and those who believe it. Maybe a little more than half, believe me. He added, some people would give me curious looks, but there was little or none of the jeering. There were a lot of Travis Walton jokes for a while. One guy would come up to another and say, hey, did you hear they found out Travis Walton was telling the truth? Yeah? Yeah, they found a Mars bar in his pocket. Yeah, they found a Mars bar in his pocket. I saw some of those things written on walls around here for a while, and some of the kids at school made up some little songs about it. Some of my close friends just sort of pretended it didn't happen. They didn't mention it. 
oh, maybe later in a conversation it would come up. But they didn't just rush up and say, hey, what happened to you with the flying saucer? He added, the family got more than I did, partly because the local people felt sorry for me, I think. I suppose some of them thought I might punch them in the nose if they said anything about it. Dwayne's horseshoeing business in Phoenix dropped to about half its usual volume just after the incident, Travis said, but may have been so partially because it was approaching the Christmas season, normally a slow time anyway. His sister, who worked in a bank, also got some unfavorable comments after the incident. Publicity brought a surge in Travis's mail. As many as 10 letters a day arrived from UFO buffs wanting minute detail on his experience. I tried to answer them all at first, he said, but there were just too many of them. I still get one once in a while, but they're down to a trickle. Basically, he was at loose ends. My whole life was kind of up in the air, he said. I wondered, where do I go from here? The incident had left its mark on him. He was no longer comfortable in the woods. I went back to a thin couple of times, but it bothered me a little to go back out. I don't like the feeling, he said. But why bother with a job anyway, right? Surely in this age of Watergate, a burglar turned lecturer, a person, blah, blah, blah. And that's the end of what we're going to read here. But I think that gives you the gist of everything, front to back, 100%. Of course, the editor of Aviation Week said that Mike Rogers couldn't finish the U.S. Forest Service contract, and that's why they did this. The Forest Service contract Mike Rogers has uh, was canceled on November 18th. So I'd like to thank you for tuning in. I am your host, Tim Doyle, and I will talk to you next time.